Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Colleen McGinn. I'm one of the directors of alumni engagement in the Office of Alumni Relations. I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight for this special webinar, which is being held in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of women at Fairfield. Tonight, we have three esteemed panelists who I'd like to briefly introduce. We have Tanya Klitsch, class of 2006, who is a lifestyle reporter for Forbes. Teresa Priolo, class of 2005, who is a Fox 5 New York anchor reporter. And Melody Serafino, class of 2005, co-founder of Number 29 Communications, who will also be our moderator. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Melody. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, Janet and Fairfield for the opportunity to have this discussion tonight. And thanks to everyone for being here. Welcome, we appreciate you spending time with us. We know everybody is experiencing Zoom fatigue right now. So really uh, excited that you chose to spend this hour with us. And uh, thanks to Fairfield for giving me an opportunity to dress up for the first time in about six months. So <laughs> I am honored to be joined by Teresa and Tanya tonight. Um, Tanya and I have had the opportunity to actually work together over the years. Teresa and I were in the same class. So we were actually all at Fairfield at the same time. Um, as Colleen mentioned, I'm Melody Serafino. I'm the co-founder of Number 29 Communications, which is a PR agency based in New York City, but doing work globally. We work with clients in the sustainability and impact spaces, helping to tell their stories in the media. So some of the brands that we work with who you may have heard of include TED, if anybody's ever listened to a TED Talk, and sustainable French sneaker brand Veja, if you've seen those really cute chic sneakers with the V on the side of them. I've also am the co-founder of a media company called Enough Media. We have a podcast um, and a newsletter and a website that is helping to tell stories of change makers, innovators, people who are finding solutions. We know the world's on fire, but our tagline is, you know, for those who are fed up but not giving up. We want to put a spotlight on people who are doing really great work in this time. So Honored to have you all here tonight. The format of this conversation will be about 40 to 45 minutes of discussion, and then we will do a 15 minute q and I thank everybody who sent questions in advance. We are going to do our best to address those within the conversation, but we encourage people to please put questions in the chat throughout the conversation because that's what I'll be referencing when we get that portion of the program. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Teresa and Tanya, who will do their bios far better justice than I will. Um, so I'll start with Tanya. If you can just tell us who you are, what you do, and perhaps how Fairfield prepared you for the work that you're currently doing. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Tanya Klitsch here. I work at Forbes, um, class of 2006. Um, so basically... It all started at Fairfield. I was a reporter for the Fairfield Mirror, and I remember interning at News 12 Connecticut when I was a junior, um, and I, the bug bit me, right? So um, now I work at Fairfield, um, I'm sorry, now I work at Forbes. There's a, a lot of alliteration throughout my <laughs> schooling and career. Um, so now I'm at um, Forbes, where I'm a lifestyle reporter. I'm a lifestyle reporter second, a business reporter first, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, right after I graduated, I worked uh, as a local news reporter. Uh, I got my start at WLNY TV 10 and 55 in Long Island, New York. I was also a former New York One reporter where I covered Queens, which is my home borough. Um, then I moved over to the digital mag magazine side as a features editor at Entrepreneur Magazine, where I I interviewed a wide range of some of the best entrepreneurs, including Damon John and Tony Robbins, then made the leap to Forbes, where I was part of the entrepreneurs and startup section. And um, I recently made the move to lifestyle, but I think of myself as someone who covers the business of lifestyle, of course. So um, also when I was at Fairfield, I went by Tanya Benedicto until I met Adam Klitsch at Barone, and we live in Brooklyn with our toddler son, and we'll have another son by end of summer. But and I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks, Tanya. Teresa. Hi, everybody. To Priolo, as Melanie mentioned, class of 2005. I was bit by the same bug that Tanya happened to be bit by, <laughs> different years, but, but, but same virus. Um, right now, I am an anchor reporter at Fox 5, 
Channel 5 in New York City. I spent the majority of my time with the station on our morning show, Good Day New York. So my day was usually a call time around 2 a.m. and I ended around 11 a.m. and then fell asleep or did whatever I needed to do for the day. Uh, and if you're familiar with Good Day New York, if it's a show that you've watched or if you've caught it from time to time, it's very much like a network morning show. So it's about six hours, six and a half hours of live coverage. So uh, it was a very fast paced, very hectic, very unpredictable, but certainly very exciting environment. I too have a child, a toddler, a three-year-old. So right after I had my son, I moved to the evening show, which provided me the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with him. So I get to balance both roles of mom until noonish and then reporter anchor uh, from noon until about 11 p.m. My career has taken me all over the place. I, it actually started at Fairfield with the Ham Channel and doing some work with them. Uh, and then they were the ones that encouraged me to get an internship in Hartford at WFSB. So I made the commute two, three times a week from Fairfield to, uh, to Hartford to intern there. They helped me find my first on-air job in Idaho Falls, Idaho. I was a reporter, then anchor there. From there, I moved to Albany, New York, where I was an anchor and reporter. <laughs> You're seeing the pattern here. And then finally, I was able to come home uh, to, well, New York, but New Jersey is home for me. So my career has been quite unpredictable, but really fun. And like Tanya, it has had a lot of different twists and turns. You meet the most incredible people uh, from the variety of backgrounds. You, you, you happen to find yourself in places you wouldn't expect telling stories that you would never imagine you'd be able to tell. But that's certainly the beauty of our business. It's not for everybody, but as Tanya mentioned, if you're somebody who has the kind of personality that can handle this ever-changing environment, once you're in, you're usually in for life. So that's where I stand right now. As far as how Fairfield helped me, as I mentioned, it, it gave me my start, essentially. Um, when I went to my first newsroom in, in Hartford, they were surprised by some of the terminology that I knew or the way that I was able to put together a story or just my sort of know-how around a, a TV studio. And I was just basing that off of what we had on campus which at the time in 2005 wasn't that extensive. I mean, the equipment that we had was great, but it, it wasn't as if Fairfield had gotten to the point where we were New House or USC where they had this massive TV studio to welcome you. And so they were quite impressed with what we had on campus and they were able to help me foster that talent, which was really incredible. And I also, from Fairfield, just they were able to foster my natural curiosity, you know, um, remind me to ask questions of people, regardless of how important they are, hold their feet to the fire, even if it's somebody that you might be intimidated by. Uh, I just really felt like they primed me for the career that I have now, which I couldn't have asked for anything better, even if I went to a place like a new house or a USC or a Notre Dame or Northwestern or wherever, I got everything I needed. And um, it really set me up for what has been a, a wild ride. So that's where I stand right now. Now let me send it back to you. Thanks, Teresa. And actually my one of my distinct memories at Fairfield is I think from the moment we were in TV classes together, you had said, I want to be a news anchor. And so it's been such a delight to watch that career tra trajectory for you. And you know, for those who are not in media or communications, we all work in concert with each other. So we're on different sides of the business, but I work with my clients to help tell stories that Teresa or Tanya would tell to their audiences. So my job is to help figure out what is that narrative, how will it be most compelling to a journalist, and how will it be most suited to their audience, and then actually write the pitch to hopefully help develop that story. So, you know, the, we're here tonight to talk about storytelling. Storytelling has become a bit of a buzzword. Um, I think, you know, certainly we would probably all consider ourselves storytellers were in the industry of storytelling, but I think the word storytelling has really extended beyond just media journalism and communications at this point. With the advent of social media, everyone has the ability to be a storyteller, whether it's for themselves as an individual, for a brand. You know, we really kind of crave these human moments in these stories, whether it's a product we support and understanding how it's made, where it's made and who's behind it, whether it's a person that we follow on Instagram and we want to sort of connect with them personally. So I'm curious to hear from you, Tanya and Teresa, on how you divine storytelling. And I don't know who wants to take it first, but. Muted. 
good. Um, I'll start real quickly. Um, right, without getting too theoretical, I know right now storytelling has taken so many forms, so many concepts and series. We've watched all these documentaries and thrillers and series where the timeline goes way out of whack. They go to the future and then back to the past. For those of you in any field who just want to master the art of storytelling, we just have to remember it has a beginning, middle, and end. And I always just want to make sure the reader walks away or the viewer walks away with a sense of enlightenment or a new emotion, um, new perspective. And it could be that simple. But I would love to also hear Teresa's take on it. Uh, to me, storytelling is is just as you said, Tanya. It's a ride. You take it. You take people on a journey. It, it doesn't always end up the way you think it should. It depends on what elements you can bring to the table. If you are a journalist, as we are, uh, sometimes it's only what's available to you. But if it's Melanie, where you're working with a client, you might have the ability to. to pull in so many more different kinds of resources, the time might allow something like that. So when I think of storytelling, I think of taking people on some sort of journey, some sort of ride. It doesn't, in my mind, doesn't really matter if you know the ending. It doesn't really matter matter if you know the beginning or even the middle. It's just that you 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 want to convey a sense of, as, she, as Tanya said, excitement uh, and it's a journey. And, and I also wanna mention, for those people who are here and they don't know if they're storytellers yet, um, I, I think a lot, a lot of people find themselves as storytellers and they didn't think that they were. It's sort of something that's developed over time. That's at least what I found. I didn't know that I was going to be a storyteller. I thought I was going to be a journalist and I didn't know that the two will be one in the same. Um, so my form of storytelling might be different than a lot of other people's. I call it reporting. Someone else might call it storytelling. So as Melanie said, you know, everybody loves the word storytelling, but it, it might, you might actually be doing it. You just might not call it storytelling. I'm curious if either of you have a story that you've told over the years in, you know, the different places that you've worked that has really been a rewarding moment for you or something that has really stuck with you, a person who you've interviewed, um, a story that you were perhaps able to unveil and tell for the first time. Is there is there that was sort of a proud moment in your career? Absolutely. And I mentioned before how when I worked at Entrepreneur Magazine, I interviewed all these big startup founders like you know, like Damon John, Tony Robbins, et cetera. But I will say that I think some of the most unforgettable characters I've interviewed were when I was a local news reporter. And I'm sure Teresa can totally speak to that. It's not just the celebrities or the big names or the big local politicians. I'm sure it's just the everyday people in whatever community she's covering that day. Or if I'm covering a small business owner, um, sometimes they're the most interesting. So as Teresa said it's a journey and it's also a lot of different voices that go into it, different perspectives. Um, so for me, when I was a local reporter, I'll never forget um, just someone, a, a young woman from the Rockaways who held a prom dress drive. You know, it just meant a lot to local teens in her neighborhood. Um, when it comes to other unforgettable rewarding stories, I'm going to bring up a story that you and I worked on together, Melody. <laughs> um, so it's, I mentioned that the audience should learn something, but the absolute best is when I learn something totally different. And I know you know where I'm getting at. Um, you know, I mentioned that I'm a mom to a toddler. So during the journey of reporting on the parental rights of women in the workplace, I began to research all the founders and entrepreneurs in that space. For the longest time, um, when purchasing products for my baby, I always found out about this new bassinet. And I thought, this is just a luxury product. Um, <laughs> this is just a high-tech bassinet. And, you know, what's the big deal about it? And then Melody and I, um, Melody <clears throat> contacted me and told me all about the founder behind the brand, who's Dr. Harvey Karp. And it turned out um, he's just not on this path of to building a luxury brand. He's actually investing a lot in technology that is saving a lot of um, uh, you know, mothers and children from a lot of dangers that happened during those during that fourth trimester. Um, Melody, I don't know if you could even pull it up very quickly, if you give it a quick Google. I will, I will um, give it a Yeah, no big deal if you can. But also, um, 
it was really awesome interviewing him and him telling me how he's donating a bunch of the best of these bassinets to women's shelters and hospitals that are doing research on um, you know, children who are born with either disabilities or those who are born to mothers who were addicts and who need the extra uh, swaying and shushing that this high-tech bassinet provides. And it's that kind of innovation that really uh, catches my heart and interest and hopefully the audiences too. But that's just one, um, that is just one rewarding story out of many, but this one was just uh, really, you know, hit me during a time when the topic of innovation in parenting was super important. And I owe that to collaborating with Melody. <laughs> so I've just pulled it. I don't know if you all can see my screen, but this is the story that Tanya is referring to. And yeah, so also, also this actually got picked up as a daily cover story by the Forbes editors. And um, as you know, right now I'm a print reporter, but I'm also an on-air digital reporter. So there was also photo essays attached to this as well as an Instagram live on the Forbes account. So that's, you know, another aspect to storytelling. How many mediums can you fit into one story? And in this case, there were many. I'm sure we could pick up, you know, show the Instagram live another day. We'll be here for like, it ran for an hour and it was a huge hit. Yeah. And also I can just attest that my client was absolutely thrilled with that story. It came out on Mother's Day weekend. So it was a really nice tie into sort of this editorial news cycle of something that felt really timely and topical. And it was also Mother's Day during a pandemic um, when so many mothers across the country were just grappling with working at home with a baby or toddler and just balancing it all. Teresa, do you have a story that particularly resonates with you? I do, but I just want to mention, I have interviewed Harvey many, many, many times. I've interviewed him for my podcast. I've interviewed him for On Air. I've interviewed him at mom's conferences. He is the world's most one, he is a gift to earth. I love him and his whole family. His wife is a major powerhouse behind their brand. His daughter is awesome. Oh, they're great. And the product actually works. I used it for my kid when, when my son wouldn't sleep. I was like, I got to try something. And that thing did the trick. So I'm not endorsing it. I'm just telling you it worked for us. <laughs> so he's, that's a good one. I will one. be Don't passing that along. <laughs> he's, oh, do you just tell him how much I love him? I get emails from him and I'm like, Dr. Harvey Karp, I have a question and I love you. So he's great. Um, stories that have, uh, really resonated. There are a couple. I mean, over the course of the last eight years at Fox, I have been able to cover all of the big stories. Thankfully, I've been able to cover all the big stories in our area from the, the very, very big ones like Newtown and being up there that day and, and witnessing the aftermath of Sandy Hook to um, really fun ones like a Super Bowl. But the I think the story, I don't know if it's the one I'm most proud of. I'm very, very proud of it, but it, I hear about it the most and I feel like it has sort of stood the test of time at this point. Uh, I started through about four years ago doing a series on Lyme disease. And it all started because uh, my the general manager of my station, his wife suffers from chronic Lyme. I didn't know what chronic, I didn't know that there was a thing called chronic Lyme like four years ago. And he said, you know, there's a, this thing called Lyme disease. And I said, yeah, when you get bit by the tick. He's like, it's just, it's not that. It, the tick doesn't just bite you and go away. It's not a rash. People are getting seriously ill. So my, my boss called me in and he said, I want you to do a story on this. And just make it like three minutes. The boss wants it. See what you can find. Don't screw it up. See what you find. I'm like, well, okay, that's a mandate if I ever heard one. And what ended up coming from that was the first of four half hour specials on Lyme disease. And in the first one, we talked to celebrities like Ali Hilfiger and Yolanda at the time, it was Yolanda Hadid, Yolanda Foster uh, from Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, who's been quite vocal about her journey to the, the top doctors that are the neurologists and neuroscientists and infectious disease doctors that are treating this around the world to actual patients. I talked to a, a, a girl who lost her ability to walk at around the age of I believe it was 11 or 12. And her, her entire goal, her motivation was to be able to walk into high school. She just wanted to walk into high school. Uh, something that had been taken away from her by this virus, by this, by this um, parasite. And what ended up happening for me was people all around the world found this on YouTube. I didn't even know that we posted it on YouTube, but, we, but the station did. And 
I, I started receiving letters from people in Australia and England, everywhere. I was Google translating Facebook messages from people. And some of them were what would be considered a suicide note, but they didn't end up uh, taking their own life because they felt like they found solace and comfort and community in watching our half hour special, which blew me away. Because I, I've done stories before where I have felt as if they've resonated with people, but I have never heard somebody tell me that they they thought twice about taking their own life because they felt like, well, if this if, New, if somebody in New York City is doing this and paying this much attention to it, then maybe maybe the tide is turning on this. Maybe I'm maybe I can show this to my doctor and they'll know that I'm not making it up that the brain fog and the chronic fatigue and the aches and pains and the weird rashes and the skin issues, I'm not, it's not psychosomatic, they're real. And that to me just, it leveled me. I, 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 I know that that kind of thing happens but it usually doesn't happen to a local news reporter. Um, you don't normally hear from people in Australia about a story that you're doing. And so one became two, now we're on four. It's been nominated for awards and it's won Emmys. And I'm just really, really happy with the fact that it has resonated with this community who has felt like for so long they have been ignored, they have made been made fun of, they have been told it's in their head and move on. And they've been diagnosed with other things like rheumatoid arthritis or Alzheimer's when in fact, maybe they didn't have those diseases, they had Lyme disease. So that's one that I think about all the time. And I still meet people who tell me, oh, I saw your special or, but I didn't see it on air. I saw it on YouTube. And I think, thank God for YouTube. <laughs> it's, it's, it's certainly helped us out. So that would be one that really comes to mind. I mean, that is sort of the is epitome. Or no just a New York anchor. She's really a global anchor because they're putting everything on YouTube, which is so awesome. Yeah. And that, but that wasn't something that I realized. Like I didn't realize, I mean, do that, but I didn't think about the reach of a of a story like that. I thought it. I thought I was just doing what my boss wanted me to do, which was not screwing up the story. And my natural curiosity was, well, if this person says this, but the CDC doesn't recognize that this exists, well, then let's go talk to the CDC. And then you get the CDC on the line, and they're giving you a story that's different than everything else that's ever been published you know, from, from the federal government and you talk, and, and the story just builds over time, over months. And it was really, it was so rewarding to know that I was able, I was healthy enough and capable enough and had the resources to do the work that so many people around the world have needed, but couldn't, didn't have access to. I mean, that truly epitomizes the, what we're talking about tonight, which is the power of story telling and just how resonant it can be for certain communities to make them feel like they're not alone or to give them information that they might not otherwise have access to. So I really love that. I'm curious, you, you, touch, you both touched on this a little bit in your initial introductions, but what inspired you to become storytellers and were there certain storytellers that uh, you looked up to over the years? I'll also keep this rooted in Fairfield again. Um, I my professors at Fairfield, um, James Simon at the time was the head of the journalism department. And I know when it comes to, I mean, I can go on and on about my favorite writers and storytellers, but um, I remember Jack Kavanaugh was also a news writing uh, professor, adjunct professor, and he at Columbia J School where I went to J School. Um, he's the author of so many top selling uh, sports novels, one being Tunny. Um, actually, I have it right here. I have a pile of sports books, and um, that's his at the top. Uh, he's one of my favorites. I didn't, as I, I, I alluded to this earlier, I don't think I really set out to be a storyteller. I, I hadn't at the time, when, at least that I was at Fairfield especially, put the two together. I knew that I wanted to tell stories I knew that I wanted to report what was happening. I knew that I wanted to be where the action was. I knew that, that I had sort of um, a penchant for that sort of excitement. But when, especially in college and maybe even the early part of my career, when I thought of storytellers, I thought of filmmakers. I thought of your Steven Spielbergs or your, or, or your novelists. I, I, I didn't think of journalists as that. And I've come to have, thankfully, a greater appreciation for what we do over the better part of the last 15 years. Um, at Fairfield, the, the person that jumps out to me, the front and 
center. I think about him all the time. Oh, wait, the lights just went out. Sorry, I'm going to get up and jump around a little bit, but I'll finish my thought if you guys can still see me. Um, the person that comes to mind for me is, is Dr. Orman, John Orman. I took his political science class and I still remember some phrases that he told us, things that we had to remember in the course of political history, in the course of a campaign that I say to myself when I'm when I'm uh, reporting on different political events. I mean, the one that comes to mind is he would always tell us a horse never changes direction midstream when we were talking about presidents in the wake of crisis or in the wake of war. I, I don't know, but his, his way of communicating was so effective and it was so beautiful that I, I consider someone like him a storyteller. It, it wasn't that he, he, he wasn't paid to tell stories. He was a, a political science junkie and a political professor, but someone like that jumps out at me. Uh, in, in the news business though, the person I have always looked up to is Steve Hartman, who's on CBS. Uh, he tells, he does a series, everybody has a story. I think he is just incredibly brilliant. Not only is he brilliant, but his photographer who, he only works with one photographer. And that gentleman is able to put together a story in pictures like no one else in the business. But there are so many, um, I'm a, big fan of Ava DuVernay. I'm a big fan. I mean, there's just, the list is long. The list is very, very long, but, um, but I've, I've, my appreciation for what it takes to tell a story has certainly grown as my time in the business has grown too. Well, my, I think it's also indicative of the fact that storytelling comes in a lot of different forms and a lot of different mediums. I mean, you were saying that you always thought of it as being documentary film or filmmaking. Um, you know, podcasts are really great ways to hear certain stories and often how I get a lot of the stories that I love, you know, and listen to. Tanya, did you want to say something too? Oh, I was just going to say my ears and face lit up the second you said Dr. Orban. I think I took four of his classes. He's a true Fairfield legend. Absolutely. So, you know, this past year has obviously been incredibly challenging, a roller coaster for new news media. I'm curious, have you had to pivot the way in which you tell stories during the pandemic? How has it impacted your storytelling? Absolutely. Well, once I, I remember it was just about March 10th, I filed a big story about a huge luxury beauty company. And I spent two, three months on it, really. It was just a lot of reporting. And of course, till this day, <laughs> we have not published it. There's no right time for it. Um, quickly, I pivoted because I'm a lifestyle reporter for Forbes that in could include fashion, beauty, lifestyle, arts, culture, restaurants, dining, travel. So how do we make sure we're not tone deaf while reporting on such topics? So I had to pivot back to becoming a business reporter and not just a lifestyle luxury reporter. And um, at the time I just, went 100% into covering and pretty much supporting the restaurant industry and hospitality industry as they were getting ravaged by the pandemic. Um, and I think one of my top interviews at the time was interviewing Tom Colicchio, who was a major voice for the uh, rest, um, Hospitality and Restaurant Alliance. Um, and I just remember talking to him about the bailout that his industry needed and more importantly, what he was just going through as a business owner, you know, we think, okay, he's Tom Colicchio, he's a big, um, you know, renowned chef and, you know, but at the same time, he's an employer of hundreds of people in different cities. What's he going through? Um, what's he demanding? What does he need um, at the moment? And that was just one thing. I interviewed him as well as as an array of other chefs and um, even um, hoteliers uh, across the country. And it was really, I remember just 24 seven um, reporting on it. And we would turn all those print stories into Instagram lives and that would just boost engagement and really put a face and voice to the quotes that I was typing out and publishing. So that's how we pivoted until this day, that luxury beauty company, I just revisited them. I said, should we revisit this? And they said, we don't even wanna talk about how business was last year. <laughs> I said, okay, that's fine. Um, you know, uh, and it was um, just being human also about what these business owners were going through um, when they had no idea what was going on. Yeah, I actually, Tanya was one of the last people that I saw in person before the world shut down. I think that Thursday, 
before everything shut down, we had a meeting together with one of my clients and we're literally getting real-time text messages with people saying, New York's about to shut down, go to the grocery store, buy everything you need. The end of the world is, is coming. And so um, it's like, it's such a distinct memory in my mind. Uh, Teresa, do you, do you have anything that you wanna share in terms of how you've had to pivot in your storytelling over the last year? It, what's really interesting about the last year is that if you think about journalists, whether it's a local journalist at a local newspaper, local reporter at a TV station, or even a network team, we do our job everywhere. We do our job anywhere. We go where the story is. So if that's a street corner, we're there. If it's a war zone, we're there. If it's Buckingham Palace, we try to get there. We, we go where it is. The, the one place where we don't do our job is at home. That is quite literally the only place where we don't have studios. We might work on stories at home, but we don't report from home. And this pandemic, I think, has forced all of us to strip ourselves bare and figure out what do we do? What do we do well? Where, what are our weaknesses? What are our strengths? Let's play to those strengths. Um, for me, around March, I wanna say it was like 17th, 18th, they set up a studio in my home and they, only did that because they wanted to make sure that should we have to give up our building if we had so many cases of COVID, that there was a couple of people within our network that had access to a camera that we could flip it on and still continue our news cycle. And we're used to it, the news cycle. We're used to constantly telling people what's going on and keeping ourselves on air, but we're not used to doing that in a one bedroom apartment in Battery Park City with a two-year-old pulling at the cable. We're not used to doing that when you're praying that he that your son doesn't have a total meltdown in the corner during dinner time when you happen to have the five o'clock or six o'clock show so it really forced us to go inward it was unnatural but um i i think i i i can speak for myself i think that it just forced me to focus on storytelling focus on what do i do best i think of good stories most often i can tell a good story i can relate to people if i can get them on the line and i can write so let me just do that. And then I can, I know that if I work with the right photographer or the right team, I can put it together. And uh, I relied on that heavily. I relied on the basics during this past year to put good stories on the air. And it has worked. Um, has it been unnatural? It's certainly been unnatural. Has it been weird? It is so weird. But I think that we have just tried to roll with the punches. And in some ways it's been amazing because everybody is available. Every, everybody that you want to interview, at least for the better part of the year has been at home. So you could get them, which you normally can't because you have to drive an hour, set up the shot, takes an hour to do the shoot. Do they have time in their schedule? Can their assistant pencil it in? Not now. They have a camera, they have a computer. We could do the interview, which means I can get them in a story. And that has been a blessing uh, to have that sort of access to people. I think I'll be a little sad when that goes away. And I hope that my storytelling as a result doesn't suffer because of that. But um, that convenience has been quite nice. I think the other thing that has happened, which I have loved uh, as a journalist, is that it seems as if this pandemic, this virus has been the great equalizer. Of course, there are communities that have been hit significantly hard, and those are stories that we need to tell. But um, in terms of how it has impacted your young working professional or sort of your the, the average expert that we would go to, whether they are multimillionaires or not, they're at home, so they wanna share their story. They wanna get their business on air. They wanna talk about how it's impacting them. They wanna get their message out. And so a lot of the hoops or the BS that we would normally have to jump through, we don't because they are so eager to get their face in front of a camera um, to share their message that they are coming to us, which has been really nice. I also have interviewed Tom Clickio, Chef Zakarian, um, a number of other people from the restaurant industry. and to hear them talk about how hard they have worked throughout their entire life to get to the point where we all know their name, especially their last name. Uh, and, and now to have this happen where their restaurants, their employees have been decimated by this has been heartbreaking. But I think a lot of the media exposure that has come over the last year on the restaurant industry and certainly the pressure that has been placed by journalists on senators and congressmen and women and state lawmakers and governors to, to pass pass the, the Restaurant Re Rescue Act or to get them the assistance that they need, which admittedly has not come yet, but there's more pressure now for them to do that than ever, I, I think has really helped their cause. And I've been grateful to be able to do that. 
I think that's actually a really great segue into my next question, which is around social media and its impact on how you both report. I mean, Tanya, you spoke to it a little bit when you were talking about the transition to doing the Forbes Instagram Lives. Teresa, you spoke about how YouTube sort of blew that story up and made it more global for you. How has social media and this, you know, so many journalists find that they have to have a personality on Twitter, on Instagram now. How has that worked for both of you? Yeah, so during the pandemic, I mean, we're not a local news station, um, so we don't have the same technical equipment that Teresa would have. So we have video producers, a video department, and I'm used to traveling from city to conference to small business to entrepreneur interview across this country with them. Um, but that all came to a halt. So it was Zoom all day, Instagram lives every other day. Um, it, like Teresa said, it's they're able to, they're eager to get their voice out, um, especially when they're home doing nothing with their hands tied. They want to speak up and it really was awesome. The best part of it is getting the audience interactivity. During those Instagram lives, you hear, you have questions directly from uh, our viewers in real time. I'm able to ask for them right then and there. Um, the YouTube comments as well. Uh, it's it's really great. It's a great way for us to interact with the audience and keep that conversation going. I have a very love-hate relationship with social media, if I'm being totally honest. Part of me thinks that it's gonna be the death of all of us and society as we know it. Another part of me thinks this is a phenomenal tool at our disposal, not only as journalists, but as people. The way that you can get out pertinent information, the way you can connect with people, the problems that are solved, the issues that are brought to light, I am all in for all of that. Um, so I think that's great. Unfortunately, there is a ton of misinformation mixed in with the real information. And I think that can also be a detriment, including in times like this where people are isolated at home, they're not doing the same social events that they would normally do. So maybe they're not speaking as freely about what's on their mind or what information they're hearing and seeing. And I think it unfortunately has had the ability to turn a lot of people inward and, you know, just create situations that are not healthy uh, going forward for not only individually or for, for society as a whole. But in terms of the benefit of social media, it has forced me to think about who am I talking to? Why am I talking to them? And what do I want to say to them? And how do I want to get it out? Um, which is the basics of what we do, I guess, on a day-to-day -day basis. But in especially on a Twitter, well, on a Twitter, I sound like an agent, on Twitter, in a tweet, um, you have to be really concise. And, and I think that that matters a lot to journalists because we do have to think about what we put out and how we say it and, and who we're talking to. On an Instagram or a Facebook, I like all platforms for different reasons. And I think all of them are really beneficial for different reasons um, in terms of the, the, the pro side. But um, I, you know, I, I love the fact that a story that we, that Tanya and I can do can go global with a tweet, can go global with a, an Instagram post, or it, it can be expanded upon with an Instagram live or a Facebook live. Um, I think that's really incredible. And the other thing that I think is really wonderful is that it takes one newspaper or one TV station. And it, as Tanya said, it, it brings them everywhere. No longer are our viewers just New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, parts of Pennsylvania. They can really be everywhere, which means I also get story ideas from everywhere and I can see how they relate to New York. Uh, the, the saying is, uh, you know, a, a, a story anywhere, if it's, if it's news anywhere, it's news in New York. A story anywhere is a story in New York. Um, and I really believe that that's true, especially when, you look, when you're looking for uh, information and for stories on social media. So I'm, I'm on, I have to tell you, I'm not, I'm on the fence about it. I, I'm concerned about where we're going in the future with it. Um, but I do think it has forced us to be a little bit more. So I want to start to transition to some of the questions that we're getting in the chat because we're getting a lot of really great questions. So I'm just going to, you, either or both of you can take these, but uh, one of the first questions is, can you please share any thoughts on applying storytelling in business? For example, using storytelling to build trust and confidence with clients, employees, teams, et cetera. I mean, I can weigh in very quickly to say that, um, you know, I think storytelling is a great way to connect with your employees, to connect with people in the workplace. It builds that human connection and trust. I'm curious what both or either of you have to say about this. 
yeah, I think it's the basis for everything we do, whatever industry you're in. I don't know that the, I don't know of an industry where storytelling at in some way, again, it might not be called storytelling, but the, the, the idea that you don't need to form some sort of narrative that you then need to sell to someone um, or convince them of isn't important. So I think you should just think about it that way. I think you should think about your business as you have a, a product or an idea or an issue that you need to convey or sell. And so how, what journey are you gonna take people on? How are you gonna convince them of that? What tools do you have at your disposal that you're gonna use in order to help them understand ultimately where you want them to end up, which is you know what, whatever your end goal is. I interview a lot of founders, a lot of startup CEOs. So I profile a lot of, you know, their journeys as entrepreneurs. And one of the, you know, one of the main questions I always ask is what inspired you to launch your business? What was the human challenge or what was the solution that you were trying to arrive to? I mean, as a business reporter, I always do have to cover, you know, what was your revenue in 2020? Um, you know, how much money did you lose due to the pandemic? Um, how much money did you have to invest? How much personal capital did you have to invest? But all those numbers aside, I think the best things about these business stories are the human elements of it. And, you know, every, um, every founder or every business leader who wants to find their story, they think they have to find that magnificent moment or that, you know, blue moon, element to an amazing to build this amazing story but really sometimes it's the relatability that really strikes the personal chord for the audience um you know a lot of companies were built because of health issues or because someone experienced burnout and was inspired to make a career leap like how many of us have felt that <laughs> so that element of relatability i also encourage you to find as a business leader or someone trying to build the business of uh, the story of your brand I would add to that also the vulnerability aspect of it. I mean, people want to hear that you're human just like them, even if you are at the helm of a company. And I think employees also want to feel that way if, as a manager or an employer to know that, you know, we're in a really hard moment right now. Just because I'm meeting a team of 10 people doesn't mean that I'm not having the same breakdowns behind the scenes that my 24 year olds on my team are having. We're all in this sort of uncertain place. And I think that relatability can actually go a really long way in the workplace. So another question that came in is, you know, this is from someone who was class of 1974, which was the first class of women at Fairfield. And back then men were seen and heard much more often in the news than on the news than women. So she's asking, do you think the climate for women storytellers is much better now and that women are usually respected as much as men? Well, those are two very different questions. <laughs> um, I don't know that women are respected as much as men. I don't know if Tanya would agree with me or not. I don't know that um, I don't know that 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 there is parity there, but I do believe that that we have come a long way in amplifying women's voices, in recognizing the importance of women's voices, um, and in explaining to the audience that a woman's voice is is as crucial as a man. In my opinion, one is not more important than the other. They're both equally important for the story that you're telling. You have to know who your audience is. You have to know what message you're attempting to convey. Um, but no, I mean, it, at least in journal, at least in TV, in the TV world, it's still much more desirable to have a deep voice. It's still much more desirable to have a free look. It's still much more desirable to be lean in. I mean, there's still some things that um, are ingrained in, in our male dominated industry uh, that haven't yet gone away, despite the prevalence of women taking, uh, you know, roles, whether it's at network television or heads of major newspapers or what have you, where they are front and center. I don't think that, sadly, I don't think the tide has turned completely, but I think we're trying. I mean, we are trying. I mean, from a business reporter perspective, the numbers speak for themselves. Women still struggle to raise venture capital for their own businesses. Um, so what I do as a, you know, I was a member of the Forbes Women team before I moved to Lifestyle, but I still continue 
every chance I get to highlight women in business, especially in the male dominated field of startups and venture capital. Um, just today published a story, the founder of Madison Reed raised another $50 million for her hair care venture. That's a total of $200 million in venture capital for her venture that she started in 2013. Um, those, I love, putting women and millions in the same headline. Um, it's the least we can do as storytellers um, to support um, women in business. And I'll just add we to that. a long way to go. I mean, I'm from industry PR, which is primarily dominated by women, but it certainly doesn't mean that the role is any more respected. So even though we have long been, it's long skewed, women centric. There's a great story, I think it's from 2014, that the feminist writer Ann Friedman wrote for New York Mag that says, why do we still consider PR the pink ghetto? And it talks about the history of this industry, which really kind of developed and came into its own in the 1950s and 60s. And it was women who were behind the scenes supporting male CEOs at companies and kind of the, the players and the people pulling the strings behind the scene and being strategic and telling them what to say and who to talk to and when to talk to them, and yet being treated basically like assistants, mm -hmm. even though these men could not have survived without them. So it's just a really interesting, I think it's an interesting illustration of the fact that even if the industry is primarily dominated by one gender, it doesn't necessarily equate to that parity that Teresa was, was sort of speaking to before. Uh, next question is, what has been the most challenging story or conversation that you have had to cover? Wow, I, mm, there have been a lot of them. Um, I think I, I would, uh, this is, this, people are gonna think this might be a canned answer, but I, but I think it's the, it's the stories where there are children involved, especially since I've become a mom and I understand the connection between parent and child, not that you need to have a child in order to understand that connect connection, but I feel it so much more deeply now than I did when I was 21. Um, I remember covering a story in my first job in Idaho Falls, Idaho, where a little boy was killed in a house fire. Uh, it was a it was a underprivileged, underserved area, and the mom had been smoking marijuana and had dumped the embers out in her hand because her kid ran in the house in the room, and she went like this, and they they um they they smoldered and burned the mattress that the kid ultimately took was taking a nap on or was going to take a nap on he died in the fire and i remember being literally 21 and having all these other senior reporters females around me saying i can't do that i can't cover this story i can't i can't do this and i kept thinking yeah it's it's really sad it's horrific what happened to this little boy but this is our job now that I'm a mom, I would never have that response. I, I, I understand innately what those women were going through. I only wish I had the compassion to understand it then. But it, it, you know, the stories like Newtown, the stories like that, even just stories where children have been victimized in some way, even if they ultimately lived, uh, just get me. And they're really tough to put into words how, how heartbreaking and how deeply they impact the reporter. I think also because we're not supposed to show emotion. So it's tough to do a story where it's, it's an emotional story and it should be emotion without yourself having to show any sort of emotion. That's a, that's a balance that I still think I'm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> as uh, you know, it's different for Teresa. She's working in, you know, very close to the community and being a bit supporter, it's maybe not as emotional, but it's actually in the past year or two, that's totally changed in addition to the pandemic, of course, the issue of race relations has popped up in 2020. And I've been interviewing a lot of African American and black um, entrepreneurs and, you know, founders of color, and they've been really speaking up about just the issues they faced and the biases they faced in the startup world. So that's also been, um, you know, it's, I'm happy to report on it, but it's very difficult to hear that this still continues. Um, you know, in uh, in the venture community. Can you share what you think are the elements of a good story? I know you talked a little bit about what, how you define storytelling, but what are the elements of a really good story in your opinion? Sometimes one voice can transform a story. And I have a great example. One of the recent ones I've done is interviewing a rapper named Rick Ross. He's a big deal. He's um, one of our Forbes hip hop cash kings. 
And of course, um, you know, he's a personality and I get a pitch, oh, he's investing a few million in this um, new telehealth app. I'm like, oh, that's great. And they're like, oh, it'll be a fabulous interview with, there you go. Um, this will be a fabulous interview with this fabulous rapper. And collaborating with other reporters in my newsroom, including the healthcare editor, um, they said, you know what, start interviewing analysts, healthcare analysts. And then I eventually stumbled upon one person who, not his co-founder, not another celebrity, but someone who just focuses on the inequalities in healthcare, the racial disparities within healthcare. Upon interviewing this uh, expert, this analyst, he was just telling me all about not just where these disparities stem from and where the distrust between the African-American community and the healthcare community started, which stems all the way back to slavery, um, where they were, you know, not just subjects of experimentation and bad healthcare, but um, to present day, the pandemic, where it just showed how digital, you know, the digital divide where students in urban communities couldn't even learn remotely because there's no good broadband. Without us investing in the broadband of inner low income communities, how are they ever going to benefit from a telehealth app? <laughs> so it just really transformed the story from something that would have been lifestyle to something that really dug into inequalities within this industry of healthcare. So that was just one um, example of what one voice can really just change the whole trajectory of a story. For me, element wise, um, I we rely so heavily on, I mean, the one, one thing that TV does that no one else can do is match pictures and sound. So I look for great photos. I look for, for a, a compelling visual moment that I can then put the proper words to. And sometimes I put no words to it and I just let the sound on tape do the sort of do all the talking for me. So I'm always looking for great video. Of course, I think a lot of stories need a protagonist and an antagonist um, to, to, to make them compelling. I have one that I, I did, it's totally different than what Tanya talked about, but many, many years ago, my first news director gave me this story that he ripped from a newspaper in Utah. And he said to me, try to figure this one out. This is a cool little cold case. And I'm like, okay, this will be fun. Uh, and we ultimately ended up calling the story, The Legend of Howard Hughes's Will. Turns out when billionaire Howard Hughes died, he left allegedly a handwritten will. And in it, he named a gas station attendant that happened to save his life when he was found destitute on, the, uh, on his way to Las Vegas. And this gas station attendant, who I ended up tracking down through the desert of Utah, finding him, interviewing him, the man was dying of cancer. Um, and he, he told me, he's like, this, this homeless man stumbled in and he needed help. So I, I told him, just get in my truck and I'll drive you to Vegas. And, you know, years after Howard Hughes' death, um, a, a, a person from the Mormon church, from the LDS church in Salt Lake City came by and dropped off a handwritten uh, will on yellow lined paper. And in it, this man allegedly was promised 1 16th of Howard Hughes' fortune, which is far more than any gas station attendant, especially in Utah is making. Um, and he had been fighting for, for decades to try to get the money that he believes he was rightfully owed. And he had been fought by the Hughes estate and he had been fought by grandkids and the, the, the Boy Scouts of America were involved and LDS. And I was able to just follow the trail. And it was a quirky story where this man is dying wish was to figure this out. And it was just such an interesting story a man that I would never meet otherwise, coming from a town of, maybe there were a thousand people in his entire town. I didn't find him by way of social media. I found him by looking through a phone book and calling this place and calling that place and checking at this gas station and this hotel and this what have you. And it was just good old gumption investigating and it worked and it was a wonderful story. It, it didn't necessarily go anywhere except I did make the impression of one pizza delivery man who uh, found me when I was staked outside of who was about to be the governor David Patterson in Albany's um, home at the time when Governor Spitzer was going through his 
midlife crisis slash downfall um, and leaving the governor's mansion. And the, I ordered a pizza to my news van and the guy delivered the pizza. And he said, your voice sounds really familiar. You sound like this girl that did this story that I happen to see on, on YouTube um, about Howard Hughes's will. And I was like, we are in Slingerlands, New York. How in the world did, did all these worlds come crashing together? Um, so that was one of the most memorable stories I've done. And it was because of this man, this, this uneducated but kind-hearted man who simply want what, wanted what was owed to him. He, he ended up dying and not getting the money, um, although different judges had. Teresa, it's not working. Internet, it looks like it's a little unstable. I, I love these stories because it really speaks to the amount of work that goes into actually developing what you ultimately see on the page or in video. Um, and I think sometimes we forget all of that sort of good old fashioned reporting and journalism that goes in behind the scenes. Oh, you're back, she's so great. Um, so we're, we're closing in on the top of the hour. I have a couple more quick questions that I want to get to before we give everybody back their evening. Um, there are a few folks, I think, that may be students who have sent through some questions. So I want to make sure that we address those. One is, what was your favorite class at Fairfield and how, uh, which one do you feel was most beneficial to your career? So just maybe take those very quickly. Mine was John Orman's classes. Favorite classes and... I still use them. I still use all of the stuff that he taught me. So hands down, any class that that man was a part of, I wanted to be a part of, and I still remember and love. I agree with Dr. Orman as well, but I also took Richard Regan's Shakespeare classes as well. Um, till this day, I have all the books still. Of course, my first news writing 101 class with Dr. Simon, um, that led me to the Fairfield Mirror, where I wrote my my first assignment for that class ended up on the front page of the mirror. And it was, um, I, Melody, I don't know if you have it still. Um, basically, yeah. So basically, um, I was just talking to a bunch of friends and they were telling me incidents they ran into. And I remember thinking, this is nuts. So this is actually where it all started. This is when the bug first bit me. This is my first um, news story for my news writing class and it made my the first front page. Um, and uh, you know, this was when I realized you can give those who don't have a voice, a voice. And <laughs> this is when you can support underrepresented people. And um, uh, so in addition to classes, get involved, write for the mirror, um, join the ham channel or I, yeah, so. Um, well, that was another question actually is which clubs were involved in. And I'll just add to the, to the class question before we move on to that. Mm -hmm. I took a business writing class as well as a public speaking class, which is required for all comms majors. So anyone who's a comms major on the call will know that. I think everybody, no matter what you major in, should take a public speaking class because you will use it no matter which career you go into. So um, on the, the clubs front though, someone did ask, is there, are there certain clubs that you would recommend joining that sort of helped you figure out your career trajectory? To build upon my last example of my first front page mirror, um, joining AHANA, which was the multicultural, multicultural organization was super important. Everyone who I quoted in that story was a member. Um, so join social organizations too. <laughs> I'll just add to that. Everything that you both said, student government as well, really helped. Just figuring out how things go, how things run, what sort of impact students can have from that perspective was really beneficial. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. It's been such a wonderful conversation. I've learned a lot speaking to both of you. I apologize if we didn't get to your question. We got a lot of great questions in the chat. Uh, I want to throw it back to Colleen just to close out the evening, but I want to just thank, thank everyone. And if you have further questions, perhaps Colleen, there's a way that you can get some of those to us and, and we can help to answer them. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, all three of you. This was a great discussion and great questions. Um, we are so grateful for all of you for giving your time. I know you're all so busy and it is greatly appreciated for sharing your insight with all of us. 
Um, there's a bunch of upcoming events happening. We ask that all of you please visit fairfield.edu slash alumni events for a full calendar to see if there's anything um, of interest coming up that you'd like to join us on. And by all means, um, if you have additional questions for our panelists, you can email alumni at fairfield.edu and we will pass them on. And we will make the recording available also to all of you um, if you'd like to view it again and something else pops up. Uh, you can reply at that time. So thanks to everyone for joining us. Tanya, Melody, Teresa, thank you again. And we'll see everyone soon. Co Colleen, can you um, share, I don't know if anybody wants their email shared or their um, social media handles. If anybody has any questions and you guys want to message, DM, whatever, whatever your preferred social media channel is, I'm happy to answer a few if anybody has them, just you can reach out to me that way or also by, by my email is fine. I'm happy to also continue this conversation. I wish this was in person so I could meet each of you from all these classes. Um, I know we're all coming from different industries and careers. One book I want everyone to read if you haven't yet is William Zinser on writing well. That will change the way you write a news story, an email, a text, it'll change everything. So <laughs> that's one last takeaway for this, hopefully. <laughs> We can compile a oh, list of, of resources, um, perhaps the links that you shared, we can put in the recap email and things like that. So I'll touch base with all of you and we can share all of that with everyone who attended, as well as your contact information. So, Awesome. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have Thank a wonderful everyone. night. Be well. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Thank you.